I've gotten even more wise since then, amen? That was a joke. First note, I'm gonna make some jokes. Feel free to laugh. Is that okay? In the fullness of his presence is joy. It's hard to be joyful without laughing, amen? Amen. People are like, my heart is joyful. I'm like, if your heart's joyful, your heart should tell your face. Okay, um, it's a privilege to be with you. Thank you so much, Anton. I love your whole family, the Kraft family. You guys are amazing. It's, it's always a privilege to be with you. I love your church. I spent some time with your teens last year. It was an amazing time. Um, I love what God is doing in your youth group, and it's a privilege to be with you. Diana, you are, you are a lot smaller since the last time I saw you. You had a baby boy. Those girls needed a, a brother, which I'm so, it's so cool to see you with them right now. You and Vadim are both amazing. And Pastor, thank you so much for having me. I really do consider it a privilege to be with you and communicate to you. I have a word today that I'm gonna share with you. Sometimes I have words that are easy to communicate. This one, I know what I'm sensing, but I'm gonna try my best to put it into words. And hopefully it makes sense. But I do believe it's strategic in this time for what your church is going into in the next 21 days. And I do believe it's applicable and it will apply to the season that the church is in. Okay, so I'm gonna try my best to communicate that to you. The accent you're hearing is South African. I'll just tell everyone, because some of you were wondering right now, why does he talk weird? It's because I grew up in South Africa. That's why I've got an accent. And yes, you have an accent too. (laughs) You have an accent. People always come up to me like, do I have an accent? I'm like, if I have an accent, you have an accent. You sound weird, I sound normal, amen? Second Kings chapter four, we're gonna read, in today's sermon, we're gonna read quite a lot of scripture. I know this church loves scripture though, so that's okay. So try to bear with me. We're gonna read a large portion of scripture a few times to try to paint a picture of what the Lord wants to say. So Second Kings chapter four, verse eight is where we're gonna start. Second Kings chapter four, verse eight. Now it happened one day that Elisha went to Shunem where there was a notable woman and she had persuaded him to eat some food. So it was as often as he passed by, he would turn in there to eat some food. And she said to her husband, look now, I know that this is a holy man of God who passes by us regularly. Let us make for him a small upper room on the wall and let us put a bed in there and a table and a chair and a lampstand so it'll be whenever he comes to us, he can turn in there. I've seen a lot of married couples. This sounds like something that happens in marriage sometimes. A guest is coming over often. The wife just goes to the husband, hey, I want you to build a whole floor for the guest. That's a big request, right? I've stayed at a lot of people's homes. They've never built a whole story for me. That would be kind of cool. Anton, I'm expecting a whole new story on the house next time I come. Verse 11, and it happened one day that he came in and he turned into the upper room and lay down there. And he said to Gehazi, his servant, call the Shunammite woman. When he had called her, she stood before him and he said to him, say now to her, look, you have been concerned with us, with all this care. What can I do for you? Do you want me to speak on your behalf to the king or the commander of the army? She answered, I dwell among my own people. So the man of God says to her, what would you like? What can I do for you? I can talk to the most powerful man in the nation. What is your request? And she says, I have no request. I'm happy around my people. Verse 14. So he said, what will be, what should I do for you? And Gehazi answered, actually she has no son and her husband is old. So he said, call her. And when he had called her, she stood in the doorway. Then he said, about this time next year, you shall embrace a son. And she said, no, my Lord, man of God, do not lie to your maidservant. But the woman conceived and bore a son when the appointed time had come of which Elisha had told her. So she's at a point in her life where she doesn't even have the dream to have a kid anymore because she's past that stage in her life to the extent where the man of God says, what can I do for you? And she says, I don't want you to do anything for me. How many of you know it's one thing to ask God to do a miracle but it's another thing for him to give you a promise that you didn't ask for. Like she's not asking for this promise. She's given up on this dream and the man of God's like, next year you will have a child. And she's like, don't lie to me. I didn't ask for a child. But a year later, what happens? She has a child. 
Verse 18, and the child grew. Now it happened one day that he went out to his father, to the reapers, and he said to his father, my head, my head. So he said to his servant, take him to his mother. When he had taken him and brought him to his mother, he sat on her knees until noon and then died. He sat on her knees until noon and then died. Here we have a story of God giving a promise to a man and his wife that they had never dreamed of and as the promise is growing, suddenly the promise is no longer there. What would you do in that moment? God gave you the promise, you didn't ask for it. God, I don't want a child. I'm not dreaming of a child. God's like, here's a child and as a child's growing up one day, it's gone. Imagine the pain you would be going through if God gave the promise, now the promise is gone. What do we do in those moments? What do we do in the moments where there seems to be a, this parallel between what God promised and what he's doing in our life? Does that make sense? When he says, hey, you're gonna have this, and then suddenly you don't have it, when the promise is no longer there. What do we do in those moments? And I wanna pray right now and then we're gonna keep speaking. Holy Spirit, I love you so much. I thank you that you're in this room. I thank you that you're present. I thank you that you're with us. Speak through me right now, Holy Spirit. In Jesus' name, amen. So I'm sure most of you have experienced this in some level in your life where God gives you a promise or you're believing something, you believe that God's gonna do something in your life but your experience is not lining up with the promise that he gave you. Have you been there before or was it just me? So I remember in 2009, I was at school one day and on a Friday, my dad would always come and pick me up from school and because it was Fridays, we would go to McDonald's. I know, I'm ashamed of it. McDonald's in South Africa is better than America. That's my excuse. I'd go to McDonald's, there's no, sh everyone's like, I hate McDonald's. Everyone says they don't go to McDonald's, yet McDonald's is the highest reselling store in America. So somebody's lying. Nobody goes there, but they sell millions of meals every year. Um, so McDonald's every Friday, I'd get the two cheeseburger meal with fries, a Coke, I remember it was Friday, I was excited for two cheeseburger meals, fries and a Coke, and my dad was on his way to pick me up from school, and suddenly I started to get a call on my cell phone. I was like, that's weird, it's an unknown number, but at that age, I was 13 or 14, it's still cool to answer the phone when you're 13 or 14, so I'm getting a phone call, I'm like, sorry guys, I have to take this, it's important. I go away, I don't know who it is, but it looks important to answer a phone call. So I answer the phone call and it's somebody that I knew from church. And I was like, this is weird, why are you calling me? And she was like, hey, I have some bad news for you. Your dad was just in an accident. I was like, okay, how bad is, how bad is the accident? She didn't know yet, it had just happened. And what, what happened was my dad was driving to pick me up from school on the highway going like 80 miles per hour and a car in the other lane was driving towards him and the guy in the other car driving towards him had a heart attack and passed away instantly. But when he had the heart attack, he swerved into my dad's lane and hit my dad head on. So you have these two high speed cars, head on accident, and now my dad's in the intensive care unit and I remember going into there, but the, the problem was, which struck me, was my dad's biggest message in life was that God is good. So. He would always preach God is good. That's what he was known for. That was the main sermon that he would preach in his life. God is good. And now I have this choice in the moment to go, do I just blindly believe that God is good even though my circumstances don't line up with it and somehow say God caused this accident but he's still good or is there another answer? What do I do in this moment? How do I respond to this moment? Did God cause his accident and somehow he's still good or was there something else at play that was taking place here? And it was actually amazing to see how God moved even throughout the accident. The, the, the um, operating people that operated on my dad said that he would be in hospital for up to nine months. He should have lost his life that night. His ribs pierced his lungs. He almost drowned. He was on a ventilator breathing for him. It was terrible. And even after coming out of a coma, after being in a coma for two weeks, the first words that came out of his mouth was God is good. 
The first words and his response, you can't make that up. You can't try to do that. But the first response he had when he came out of being on a breathing machine was God is good. And they said to him, you'll be in hospital for up to nine months and three weeks later he was at home. And all these non-Christian people working in the hospital still call him the miracle man to this day. They don't believe in God, but they witnessed the miracle that day. But in those moments where the promises of God aren't lining up, I believe God was good, but here my dad is in an accident. I'm walking in to see him, and he has a machine that's breathing for him. There's no life. Without that machine, he would be dead. There's a machine that's keeping him alive. Yet I have a choice to make in that moment. Am I going to believe God's word, or am I going to believe the experience? Am I going to cut the... Yeah, so let's... What do, we, what do you do when you're believing for your mom to get healed and then they just get worse? What do you do in those moments? How are you gonna respond to those moments? We have to ask ourselves, is what they're going through God's will or not? Is everything that happens on earth God's will? Is my dad getting into the accident God's will or not? Are the hardships that we go through God's will? Is that child passing away? In 2 King, is that, is that God's will? Is everything that happens God's will? Turn with me to Matthew chapter 8. Verse 23. Now when he got into the boat, his disciples came with him, and suddenly a great storm arose on the sea. So the boat was covered with the waves, but he was sleeping. And his disciples came to him and woke him up saying, Lord, save us, we are perishing. But he said to them, why are you afraid? O you of little faith. Then he arose, rebuked the winds and the sea, and there was a great calm. So the men marveled saying, who can this be that even the wind and the sea obey him? If God was the one that sent the storm, why would Jesus calm it? If God is the one that's sending all the storms in our life, why would Jesus calm the storm? Wouldn't he have responded to them, I'm not calming the storm, I'm the one who sent the storm. But that's not his response and he's modeling something to us that not all the storms we go through in life are sent by him. Sometimes we call to speak to the storm and silence the storm instead of saying God sent the storm. We call to take the authority he's given us and speak to the wind and speak to the waves and say, I command you to actually stop now in Jesus' name. Versus sitting back going, oh, God sent the storm. God's trying to kill me. God's trying to teach me a lesson right now. The lesson is use your authority to calm the storm. Another example for you. Let's turn to Luke 10, 19. I'll read it to you. Behold, I give you authority to trample on serpents and scorpions and over all the power of the enemy, nothing by shall any means hurt you. So we have a promise from God that nothing will hurt you and you have authority over all power of the enemy. Incredible promise, right? That is Jesus saying that to you and I. That you and I have authority over all power of the enemy and nothing will hurt us. So God gives us this promise. He gives his disciples this promise. But if you turn to Luke's, uh, Matthew 17, sorry. Remember, I told you lots of scripture today. Matthew 17. Verse 13. No, next one, 14. And when they had come to the multitudes, a man came to him kneeling down and saying, Lord, have mercy on my son, for he is an epileptic and suffers severely. For he often falls into the fire and into the water. So I brought him to your disciples and they could not cure him. So here we have a, what, what's wrong? I thought the disciples had authority over all power of the enemy. Yet they couldn't cast this demon out. So they have all authority yet this demon's not coming out of this person. I wonder how many of us would have responded to this parent 
and said, how dare you ask Jesus for the child to be set free? If Jesus wanted him to be set free, the disciples would have set him free. I wonder how many of us would have responded if it was God's will, your child would have already been set free. How dare you ask me to pray because my disciples already prayed and nothing happened, which means it's God's will for the child to still have the issues. I wonder what our response would have been in this moment. But Jesus says, you faithless and perverse generation, how long should I be bear with you? Bring him to me. And Jesus rebuked the demon and it came out of him and the child was cured that very hour. So what does this show us, the story? It shows us not everything that happens in our life is God's will. Otherwise, when they had prayed for the child, the demon would have come out, right? Because we can see clearly that it's Jesus' will for that demon to come out because that's what happens when he prays for the child. So, what, so what's happening in the story? The disciples praying for him, they aren't seeing Jesus' will fulfilled in their life. Do you see what I'm saying? So then Jesus comes and says, okay, demon, I command you to come out. So his will is fulfilled and the demon comes out. It's always God's will for demons to come out. It's always his will. So the question is, why didn't the, why didn't the disciples see the demon come out? He says it, you faithless and perverse generation. And then he goes on, and this is why it's applicable for us as a church in the season. They say, Jesus, why couldn't we cast the demon out? He says, because of your unbelief, for assuredly I say to you, if you have the faith the side of a mustard seed, you will say to this mountain, move, and it will move, and nothing will be impossible for you. However, this type only comes out through prayer and fasting. This type only comes out through prayer and fasting. He's not talking about this type of demon only comes out through prayer and fasting. The whole passage is about unbelief. He's saying this type of unbelief only comes out through prayer and fasting. So why do we pray and fast to get rid of unbelief in our life? That's the goal of praying and fasting. If you think praying and fasting is twisting God's arm to do a miracle for you, it's not. That's called manipulation. God's not like, oh, Jesus, this one hasn't eaten in 21 days. I think we should do the miracle. Otherwise, he's gonna starve himself to death. Can we do the miracle? Okay. You aren't manipulating God. If you fast, but you don't see God more than you usually do, there's no point fasting. You may as well eat. God's not impressed by our fasting. God, I haven't eaten in 20 days. Okay, son, here's the miracle. That's not how it is. I'm putting aside food, why? To seek God more than usual. Instead of eating, I'm choosing to seek Him. And when I seek Him, unbelief leaves my life. And faith comes into my life. That's why we fast, not to just put aside food. Does that make sense? We fast to abstain from food or whatever it is to seek Him instead. And while we're seeking Him, we get rid of unbelief in our life. When we seek Him, we get rid of the unbelief in our life. That's the goal of this next season as a church, as we seek Him. And do you notice how Jesus doesn't say to the child, the reason why the demon didn't come out is because you didn't have enough faith. He doesn't blame the child's faith, he blames the disciple's faith. Good word, Dylan. <laughs> you see what I'm saying? We like to blame the child's faith. I understand because it's, it's, it's way more comfortable for us. It's way more comfortable if I, oh, I prayed you didn't get healed, that's on you. Me, I'm good. I've got so much faith. If you had more faith, you'd get healed. It makes us so comfortable. We live comfortable lives blaming other people's faith. But Jesus doesn't go, oh, you child, you need more faith. Disciples, you guys are good child, more faith. That's not what happens. He blames the one praying. When I don't see somebody healed, I don't go, you don't have enough faith. I'm like, God, help me get rid of the unbelief in my life. God, I need more faith. Because Jesus never said to anyone, I couldn't heal you because you don't have faith. Good word, Dylan. I brought my own encouragement, it's too late. I'm here, I'm encouraging myself, it's awesome. <laughs> the problem with blaming the child's faith is you cut the tension in your life. Don't cut the tension. That's the title of today's sermon, don't cut the tension. Don't cut the tension. 
When you feel tension in your life between what God promised you and your experience, don't cut the tension to live more comfortable. Allow the tension to provoke you into greater action. When you have tension in your life, you have two options. When you have tension in your life, you have two options. The first option, greater complacency. Being more comfortable. If God wanted to heal you, he would have healed you. More comfortable. The second option is allowing the tension to provoke you into action. When you have tension in your life, those are your two options. Am I gonna seek God and have action to see his will fulfilled? Or am I gonna become more complacent by cutting the tension and saying if God wanted it to happen, it would have happened? We need to be believers that don't cut the tension in our life and actually seek to be uncomfortable. And I understand that's hard sometimes because being comfortable is way easier, right? Can we be real? Being comfortable is a lot easier. I remember a few years ago, I was preaching at a church and I love going off the healing and seeing God heal people. And we were doing a healing part of the service and backs are getting healed and shoulders are getting healed and headaches are getting healed. I'm like, this is amazing, thank you, Jesus. And I look over and there's a woman in a wheelchair on the front row. And Jesus paid for her healing just like he paid for that back to be healed or that head to be healed. But if I can be vulnerable with you, this is the thought that went through my mind. I don't wanna pray for her because if she doesn't get healed, that's gonna make me too uncomfortable. That's the thought that went through my mind. If I don't pray for her, it's gonna be awkward because the whole service is gonna be like, why didn't she get healed? These are the thoughts that are going through my mind. And I chose that moment to not pray for her, which I've repented since, but I chose to be comfortable instead of, I would rather now pray for her. Maybe she doesn't get healed, but I go to God, seek God to get rid of unbelief and have more faith in my life. I wanna live uncomfortable. I wanna have the tension in my life. I wanna keep praying and maybe they don't get healed, but I keep going back to God and saying, God, I'm not stopping until you remove the unbelief from my life. I'm not stopping until that wheelchair is empty. I'm not stopping until miracles start to happen. I'm not gonna live a comfortable, boring Christian life. I'm gonna keep pressing into you and praying and fasting until I see your will fulfilled in my life. Don't cut the tension. Allow the tension to provoke you into action. The temptation of tension is to cut it, to enter into compl- to complacency when it should be an invitation into greater power and intimacy. I'll say it one more time. The temptation of tension is to cut it and enter into complacency when it should be an invitation into greater power and intimacy. When there's a tension in your life, choose to seek God in that moment to see his will fulfilled. What if instead of running from tension, we sought after it and became those who seek discomfort? Let's read another story. John 11. I told you, there's gonna be a lot of scripture this morning. Are you guys okay? John 11, it's the story of Lazarus. I might not read the whole thing, just to save time, but there was a certain man who was sick, Lazarus of Bethany, verse one of John 11, the town of Mary and her sister Martha, and it was the Mary who anointed the Lord with fragrant oil and wiped his feet with her hair, whose brother Lazarus was sick. Therefore the sisters sent to him saying, Lord, behold, he whom you love is sick. Pause. The one thing I love about this, think about this. If, If you had to write God a letter to heal your sibling, what would you say? You had one letter to convince God to heal your sibling. What you write in that letter would say a lot about what you believe about healing. I wonder how many of us would write, God, the one who who has served you for years is sick. God, the one who loved you is sick. God, the one who cooked for you and housed you is sick. But that's, the sisters understand something that sometimes we don't realize. God is not motivated by what you've done for him, but his love for you. They simply go, hey, Jesus, the one you love is sick. And they know that's gonna be enough. They know it's gonna be enough. God is not motivated by what you can do for him. He doesn't do miracles for you because you love him so well, which is actually a good thing. Some of you are like, how dare you? That's good news. He's not motivated by you. Oh, he healed me because I love him so well. Nope. He healed you because he loves you so well. When you were a sinner, he died for you. How well did you love him when you were a sinner? 
not very well. That was free. That little note was free. I just think that's cool. Verse, verse four. When Jesus heard that, he said this, the sickness is not unto death. So now, they say, Jesus, our brother's sick. Jesus is like, hey, he's not gonna die. Let's skip down a bit longer. Verse 14, Jesus said to them plainly, Lazarus is dead, and I'm glad for your sakes that I was not there that you may believe. Nevertheless, let us go to him. So Jesus promises you that your sibling's not gonna die, and then your sibling dies. I don't know about you, that would be hard for me. Anyone else be, like, I would be annoyed at God. Can you say that in church? God, you told me he's not gonna die and now he's dead. And the Bible says Jesus waited two days to come to him. He's like, he's gonna be fine. Then Jesus stays two more days and hangs around. Shows up four days later to the one that he said wouldn't die but is now dead. What a tension. The God of the universe told you that your brother wouldn't die and then he died. Those are the tensions that I'm talking about. Let's scroll down. So Jesus comes to him now, verse 32. Then when Mary came where Jesus was and saw him, she fell down at his feet saying, Lord, if you had been here, my brother would have not died. Therefore, when Jesus saw her weeping and the Jews who came with her weeping, he groaned in the spirit and was troubled and he said, where have you laid him? They said to him, Lord, come and see. The next verse, the shortest verse in the Bible. Jesus wept. Jesus wept. Somebody recently said to me, I love the verse that Jesus wept because it shows his humanity. And I said, I love the verse where Jesus wept because I think it shows his godliness. Sometimes you think that crying is weakness. I think it's strength. If God cried, it's okay to cry. The God of the universe cried. And we're like, I'm not gonna cry. If God cried, it's probably okay to cry sometimes. When you go through something hard, it's okay to cry. Not very amens, but that's okay. Jesus cries, Jesus weeps. Then the Jews said, see how he loved him. And some of them said, could this man who opened the eyes of the blind also have kept this man from dying? I was reading this passage and what the Holy Spirit revealed to me is he said, often because we cut the tension, we meet the God who weeps, but not the God who resurrects. I'll say it again. Often because we cut the tension in our lives, we meet the God who weeps, but not the one who resurrects. Because in a moment like this, the temptation is to go, well, it was God's will to take Lazarus. Well, it was God's will that Lazarus died. God needed more angels in heaven or whatever the language we use in church is. We cut the tension and we meet him as the one who mourns. But if you only meet him as the one who mourns and cut the tension, you'll never see him as the one who resurrects. And we are meant to meet Jesus as the one who mourns, but also the one who resurrects. Because what happens in the story? Jesus resurrects Lazarus. Lazarus comes back to life. He weeps, but then he also resurrects. And I asked myself for a long time, Jesus, why? Why did you allow Lazarus to pass away? He had done miracles from far away before in scripture. Why, why not do it again in Lazarus' story? And I asked him that for weeks and it frustrated me. And I'm not someone who believes in the statement, well, you won't know until you get to heaven. Because that implies that I can't know God until I get to heaven. Okay, so I was reading it for weeks and the answer is found in the next chapter, John 12, verse 11. This is what it says. Because on a, of account of him, many of the Jews went away and believed in that city. So because he died and then was resurrected, the whole city that originally wanted to kill Jesus now ends up being saved. The city that wanted to kill Jesus now ends up being saved because he died and came back to life. So when God doesn't answer your prayer, trust that he has something better in store than what you asked for. 
They were asking for one resurrection. They were asking, not a resurrection, a healing. God, heal Lazarus. And he didn't get healed, but what did happen? He got resurrected, and because he got resurrected, a whole city met Jesus instead of one person being healed. So when something doesn't go according to your plans or your prayers, trust that God has something better in store than what you asked for. Don't cut the tension. I wonder sometimes if we cut the, here's a good example of how we cut the tension. It's easy for us to care about the child in Africa or the atrocities in the Middle East, which we should care about, right? We hear about someone in Africa that's struggling or a nation or a city or a tribe and we'll sow money and we'll pray and we'll be so worried about those injustices. But I wonder sometimes if we're more worried about those injustices than the injustices in our own city because if we cared that much about the injustices in our city, it would mean we'd have a life of being uncomfortable. Because when I care about injustices that are far away, all I can do is sow money and pray. But what about if we were that worried about our own city? It would require a life of being uncomfortable. Like when you see a homeless person in downtown, does it still break your heart? When you see, your, when you see parts of town that are devastated by drugs or alcohol or whatever it is, does it break your heart? Or have you cut the tension and been like, no, I'm not gonna do that, I'll sow into Africa or Asia. I'm saying let's pick up the tension in our own city. Let's live uncomfortable lives. But God, it's not okay that my, that my town looks like this. I wanna see my town transformed. Does that make sense? And I'm saying we should sow into other nations and continents. I agree, but not at the cost of cutting the tension in, a, in our own city. Let's live uncomfortable lives. The question then becomes, what do we do when we have that tension in our life? What do we do when we're uncomfortable? Let's go back to where we first started this talk. Let's go back to 2 Kings chapter four. We're gonna pick up in verse 21. I'm gonna read 11 verses, try to stay with me. Verse 21, 2 Kings 4, 21. And she went up, she went up, so this is after her child's death. She went up and laid on the bed of the man of God, shut the door upon him and went out. And she called to her husband and said, please send me one of the young men and one of the donkeys that I may run to the man of God and come back. So he said, why are you going to him today? It is neither the new moon nor the Sabbath. And she said, it is well. Then she got ready, said to her servant, drive and go forward. Do not slacken the pace for me unless I tell you and so she departed and went to the man of God at Mount Carmel. So it was when the man of God saw her afar off that he said to a servant, Gehazi, I look, the Shunammite woman, please run to her and meet her and say to her, is it well with you? Is it well with your husband? Is it well with your child? She answered, it is well. Then when she came to the man of God at the hill, she caught him by the feet. Gehazi came near to push her away, but the man of God said, let her alone. For her soul is in deep distress and the Lord has hidden it from me and has not told me. So she said, did I not ask for a son, my Lord? Did I not say, do not deceive me? Remember, it's one thing when you ask a promise from God. It's another thing when God gives it to you and you didn't ask for it. Then he said to Gehazi, get yourself ready. Take my staff in your hand and be on your way. If you meet anyone, do not greet him. Let's go to the next verse. And the mother and the child said, as the Lord lives and your soul lives, I will not leave you. So he arose and went with her. Now Gehazi went ahead of them and laid the staff on the face of the child and there was neither voice nor hearing. Therefore he went back to meet him and said, the child has not awakened. When Elijah came into the house, there was a child laying dead on the bed. God's promise is lying dead on the bed. And he went in therefore, shut the door behind the two of them and prayed to the Lord. He went up and lay on the child, put his mouth on his mouth, his eyes on his eyes, his hands on his hands. And he stretched out on the child and the flesh of the child became warm. And he turned and walked back and forth in the house and again went up and stretched himself out on the child. The child sneezed seven times and opened his eyes. A few things in the story. It, it, it's interesting how she comes to her husband. 
and goes, hey, get ready, I need to go and see the man of God. And, and the husband responds, is it well? Is it okay? What are you going to see? And her response is, it is well. She lies in a way to her husband. A few moments later, the man of God's assistant comes and says, what are you doing here? And again, her response is, it is well. She, she understood something, that they couldn't help her with this problem. The only one that could help her with this problem is the one who gave the promise. Sometimes we're so quick to go to everybody else to ask for help instead of the one who gave the promise. What does she know? She knows that she's going, she never asked for the promise. It's the same as healing. Like you didn't ask to heal the sick. God told you you would heal the sick. God told you you would cast out demons. God told you you would resurrect. So what do you do when it doesn't happen in your life? You don't go to your husband or, or wife or friend or family. You go back to the one who gave you the promise. You go back to God and you say, God, this is not okay because you gave me the promise. You return the promise to the one who gave it. You know, like when you get something in the past, in the mail that wasn't meant for you, they return it to the sender, right? It's the same way you return it to the sender. Send it back to the one who gave it and say, God, this story is not done because your promise hasn't been fulfilled in my life. That's what she does. That's what we need to do when God's promises aren't fulfilled in our life. We don't need to cut the tension. We need to take the promise back to the one who gave it. We need to go to the secret place and say, God, this is your promise. You gave it to me. I'm not stopping until it's fulfilled in my life. And I wonder how many of us God is calling to pick up promises again today. What promises are dead in your life that you one day believe for and now you've cut the tension and no longer believe for it anymore? What prophetic words do you have over your life? What, what dreams or passions did you once believe in and now they're dead like the Shunammite woman's child is dead? But I believe today God wants to resurrect those passions and those promises in our life. Not only does He want to resurrect the passions and promises, but He wants us to pick up the tension once again. Some of us have cut the tension and I believe today that God is inviting you to pick up the tension once again. There's things that used to trigger you, used to provoke you, you used to be hungry for more of God, you used to be hungry for the sick to be healed, for people to be saved and you've cut the tension. God is inviting you again this morning to pick up the tension. I just want us to stand right now and the band can come up. God is inviting us this morning, this afternoon, to pick up the tension once again in our life. To say goodbye to a comfortable life. To allow us to be uncomfortable once again. The Holy Spirit is called the comforter for a reason. Why would you need a comforter in your comfort zone? The Holy Spirit's called the comforter for a reason because we're supposed to live uncomfortable so that He can comfort us. If you're always comfortable, you don't need a comforter. Don't cut the tension. God is calling us again to pick up the tension. What I want us to do right now is if this message speaks to you and you know that you've cut the tension in your life and you start to live an uncomfortable life, you're like, hey, I actually want to pick up the tension again. Or maybe you've allowed some promises to die in your life and you want those promises to be resurrected again today. I want you to come to the front so we can just pray for you during worship. So if that's you, just come forward right now. If there's anyone in the room, just come forward. Where you've cut the tension in your life, where you've allowed yourself to live an uncomfortable, where you've allowed yourself to live a comfortable life. There's no shame, just come forward. As we go into worship, we're just gonna worship, and if that's you, just feel free to come forward. I'm just gonna pray over us, and we can go into your song of worship. Holy Spirit, we love you. We thank you that you're resurrecting promises again right now. God, we thank you that you're inviting us into greater intimacy, into greater power, into knowing you more than ever before. God, we don't wanna cut the tension in our lives. We don't wanna cut the tension in our lives, God. We want to be Christians that are provoked to action. We want to be Christians that walk in power. We want to be Christians that are led by your Spirit, that don't live comfortable lives. God, give us the grace to live uncomfortable lives. Give us the grace to pick up the tension once again in our life. Thank you, Holy Spirit.